Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Van Zyden, and I'm the Executive Director for Women's Health here at El Camino Hospital. It's great to have you all of you here um, on our topic of menopause. Um, there's a few things in front of you that I wanted to point out. One is, if you're not enrolled in Health Perks, please take an, a moment to enroll yourself, and you can leave this on the table. We'll pick it up, and uh, we'll enroll you. It's an opportunity for you to learn more about programs such as today. We also do other health forums as well as provide monthly health tips and updates for you. So now what we do is like to get started. So today's topic is Change Happens, Explore the Fact and Fiction of Menopause. And we're so pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Katherine Sutherland. Uh, Dr. Sutherland um, went to medical school and did her internship and residency all here local at Stanford University Medical Center. And she has her certification uh, with the American Board of OBGYN. And her specialty is women's health. And she's done that here for over 30 years. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sutherland. Well, it's a pleasure to be here talking about, obviously, an interesting topic from the turnout. Um, I have been in women's health for over 30 years, initially doing OBGYN, now doing GYN only. And so what that's meant is that I have a lot of experience in this area. Some of it is personal experience. So as you can probably tell, I've been through menopause. Um, and personal experience can account for a lot. Um, I, we each go through menopause with our own individual changes, and it's a very unique experience for all of us. That's going to be a theme that you'll hear over and over again. Sometimes patients ask me, did you take hormones? What did you do? How did you cope with the menopause? Well, again, very unique. I had breast cancer. I couldn't take hormones. So I had to do other things. And so again, each of us moves through it according to our own experiences. The other way I can add to information on menopause is from learning through my patients' experiences. So I, over the years, I've helped some women deliver their babies, some have needed surgeries, and then some have gone through menopause. So I've actually walked through these stages of lives with literally thousands of women. And although, again, you don't want to be anecdotal about how you learn things, going through those experiences with women in thousands of different ways has really added to the ability to help make judgments about what we should do with menopause. And then finally, I, a lot of what I want to say today and what we should all pay attention to is, is evidence-based medicine. And so, again, this is one of the areas that I feel is now my, my specialty. And so um, I pay attention to every article that comes out even though sometimes we'll see articles that are direct polar opposites of each other in terms of what their conclusions are. So somehow we have to take all this mix and put it together. And I don't promise that I can do that today, but I did leave lots of time for questions. And so hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions today too. So menopause, the main things I'd like to cover, first of all, what is it? And again, lots of misconceptions about this. Even the definition of menopause can be confusing. Why do we care? And that may be a no-brainer, but we'll talk a little bit about symptoms of menopause. And then what can be done? Again, as many different answers as there are different experiences. Um, we find sometimes that we are always looking to the future. What are my goals? What am I going to do next? What's the next job? What are my children going to do? What am I going to do when they leave the nest? Um, or we're looking at the past. You know, I loved that last vacation or I loved something else going on. The hardest thing sometimes is living in the present. Um, but if there's any time when we ought to be thinking about the present, it really is in menopause. This is a time of change. So it's a time of making new decisions. Um, it's a time where the children leave the nest. It's a time where health changes. 
where we have elderly parents that are having changes in their health. It's a time of job changes for multiple reasons, and then certainly a time of hormone changes. So you put all of this together, it's important to stop and take stock of where you are, where you're going, realizing that there's a lot of balance that needs to go on in women's lives. So menopause, what is it? Again, you can't really say for sure that you're in menopause until you've gone a whole year without a period. So it's almost a retrospective definition. Menopause starts at the last period. And then you're in postmenopause for the remainder of your life. Perimenopause is that time, which may be three to five years or so, that starts as soon as your hormones start changing. And perimenopause is often the time when we see some of the most symptoms, you know, hot flashes, night sweats, changes in menstrual periods. Perimenopause also includes the time of hot flashes, and hot flashes actually can last well into postmenopause. Um, I can I can assure you, I'm still having hot flashes. So, so again, there's a there's a lot of variation here too. We have women that never have a sign or symptom of perimenopause. One day, their periods stop. They never have any problems, and that's all there is to it. That's probably the minority of cases. So, but for some women, perimenopause lasts a year, a few months, five years. And for other women, again, it may, be, it may be that they have no symptoms until the periods completely stop, and then is when their symptoms really start. So again, lots of variations in how this all works. Well, what's causing it? It's the hormone changes that are causing a lot of the signs and symptoms. So during the reproductive years, until perimenopause starts, we tend to make hormones on a regular basis in a cyclic way. Very organized, regular periods, predictable for the most part. Starting in perimenopause, the hormone signals are changing. And so we have higher highs of hormones, lower lows. There's big differentials between the low and the high the periods become irregular. So they're no longer controlled as well by hormones, which is one of the reasons why they can become so strange. And then finally, in postmenopause, that's when the hormone levels kind of hit ground zero and stay there. So that's when they're no longer having these major big transitions. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Crazy symptoms. So. We're going to look at these a little bit more individually because, in general, the symptoms don't hit you all at once. Oftentimes, the first thing will be the periods. So as the hormones change is when we start to see the changes in the periods. They may become irregular. They may become heavier or lighter. They may become longer or shorter. The intervals may change. So basically, periods that you used to set a clock by, it's anything goes. And yet, anything really doesn't go, because you have to watch out that you're not having abnormal bleeding, which could be a sign or something of something else. So again, very confusing time in terms of the periods because of the confusing hormone signals that your uterus is getting. So what's one of the next symptoms? hot flashes and night sweats. So what happens if you're sleep deprived? Bad things. <laughs> you're tired the next morning. Um, mood swings. Um, again, you feel irritable, you feel anxious, um, depressed. Many women will notice a weepiness that they never had before that's not part of their personality. Um, many women will feel very self-conscious or they'll, they'll 
start to feel that they're not doing their job as well or people are, are watching them at work. And again, sometimes they feel they're not doing their jobs as well because they didn't get any sleep and so they can't think as well. In fact, for some women, it's the cognitive changes that are the single most problematic part of menopause. Um, they just, their memory is shot. Um, they can't function as well. Um, again, it's just they don't feel like themselves. All of these things are coming together. And then, of course, there's the physical symptoms. So these include lots of different things. Um, menstrual migraines are really common during that time of irregular periods. So women who never had migraines before will start to have, because of the very sudden drops in hormones, they'll have excruciating migraines that may last for a couple of days. Um, Gas and bloating is a common complaint. And of course, weight gain. And where does the weight gain go? The weight gain goes around the middle. It's very frustrating in you know, active, healthy young women that all of a sudden they can't, their belts aren't fitting anymore. Um, irregular heartbeats, palpitations can worry a lot of women. They, they find themselves in the cardiologist office because of palpitations that are, that are in fact a part of some of these hormone changes. Um, hair thinning, brittle nails, I mean all of these things that you weren't expecting. Well, what else happens? Um, <laughs> Low libido is one of the first things. Now, maybe that's because of poor sleep and fatigue and mood changes and feeling overwhelmed and all of the other things, but it can affect relationships. It can increase depression. Um, and then the low libido isn't helped by the vaginal dryness. Now, vaginal dryness tends to be one of the later effects of menopause. So whereas the hot flashes and night sweats tend to happen more just in the, even in the early stages where you're still having periods of the perimenopause, the vaginal dryness may be two or three years into, men into postmenopause. Um, but again, it takes women by surprise. Sometimes they think, I'm done with the hot flashes. I'm done with those other things. But all of a sudden, you know, my, my sex life is gone. I have no interest. My, it hurts. It's never hurt before. You know, that's not necessarily just a part of getting older. That's a part of hormone changes and a part of hormone changes that can, that can be um, helped. Um, there's urinary changes. In fact, the low estrogen sometimes causes um, leakage of urine, sometimes causes urinary tract infections, recurrent urinary tract infections. And then um, bone loss is the final thing. Uh, bone loss tends to be a later problem with menopause. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are a few things that, again, menopause is just, it's a good time to start thinking about them. We need to be proactive. We need to be preventative in how we deal with them. So that's all very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> So here we have the seven drawers of menopause. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. So what to do? Well, I think the first thing that, that I recommend is thinking about what are your goals. So in the woman who's weepy, those may be the goals. In the woman whose cognitive function is changed, those may be the goals. In the woman with hot flashes and night sweats who can't sleep, those may be the goals. In the woman where it's a sexual problem, sexual dysfunction, those may be the goals. So I think one of the things to do is really look at what the goals are. Just because you're in menopause doesn't need you meet, doesn't mean you need to be treated. So as long as you're happy, life's going along, those are not problems for you. And for many women, none of those symptoms we just talked about are problems. Um, you don't necessarily need to do anything. 
Um, now, that said, you do need to take care of your health. So again, there's prevention of long-term issues is important no matter what. Um, lifestyle issues is very important. And we always want to balance the pros and cons of anything that we're doing. So, um, so if you are having problems, there are lots of treatment options. And usually the first thing that we'll look at are the lifestyle options. Um, exercise, healthy diet, stress management can really go a long way for lots of women. I'll talk about hormonal options because I think that's one of the areas where there's the most confusion and the most interest in knowing, is this an option for me? And then finally, non-hormonal medications for those women where hormones may not be the right option. So lifestyle, sometimes it's as easy as dressing in layers or using fans. It can go a long way sometimes. Um, for vaginal symptoms, vaginal lubricants or moisturizers work for, work for some women as well as hormones do. Stress reduction, I think, is very important. And again, it kind of goes back to, you know, don't feel so overwhelmed with what you're doing that you can't take stock of what you should be doing and which direction you should be moving at the time of menopause. Exercise is a cure-all for everything. Um, it kind of helps with that menopause belly around the middle. Um, it helps with prevention of osteoporosis, prevention of heart disease, but it can also really help with the stress reduction, the, um, the sleep at night. Um, I mean, exercise truly is, if we could put it in a pill and give it to everybody, it would go a long way for helping. Um, there are a number of, oh, sleep hygiene, again, helps too. So if you're getting a good night's sleep, everything's a little bit better. Um, and then there's over-the-counter options, black cohosh, estravera, soy products. Now, although the studies are so-so on these, oftentimes they don't perform much better than placebo. In my experience, I've definitely had patients that have given me the feedback that these have worked for them. And so, again, especially if you're motivated to avoid taking, taking medications, um, I do think these are often worth a try. So hormone treatments. The bottom line is that you're missing hormones in menopause. It's a, it's a rapid transition. Your body is reacting to the loss of hormones that, for the most part, the most effective treatment for the most symptoms is hormone replacement. But it should be individualized based on what your goals are and also what your risks are. Again, it's not going to be right for all women. Um, and, I, and I'm always a little concerned about the menopause specialists that say all women should be on hormones. I've had women you know, at very high risk for things like breast conditions that are, that are being handed hormones because that's, what, that's all they do is they, give, they feel all women in menopause should have hormones. Um, and they should have, it should be based on blood levels instead of symptoms. Well, to me, I really feel like our goal is that you have a good quality of life, that your goals are met, not an arbitrary number that comes up on a lab test. So the issues of risk and benefit really are where we need to individualize for each woman. And this can be a little tricky. First of all, we have to look at your baseline risks. Um, if you've had conditions that put you at very high risk of breast cancer, then we have to look carefully at what combination of hormones is right for you, how long you should take them, just how it weighs in on something like the risk for breast cancer. Likewise, for things like heart disease, um, some women with a high LP little a may benefit from hormones. Other women may not benefit from hormones um, when it comes to heart disease. So again, lots of different things. Maybe your only long-term risk is osteoporosis. 
you know, maybe hormones are the best way for you to, to put yourself in a good position for preventing osteoporosis in the future. So again, it's not necessarily indicated for that, but it may be that it'll kill multiple birds with one stone. It may turn out to be the best thing. The age of a woman and how long she's been in menopause, we now recognize as being critical issues in the whole risk-benefit analysis. And I'm gonna, I will address that a little bit a little bit more, but basically the younger the age when you start hormones, the lower your risks. And the shorter the time you've been in menopause, the lower your risks of having serious complications. And then finally, there's, there's a big issue that's become more clear, and that is that there are different risks when we give women a combination of estrogen and progesterone compared to if we give them estrogen alone. For women who have a uterus, giving them estrogen alone increases the risk of uterine cancer by about seven times. And so we have to be aware of that and have to do something to protect the uterus. That's where the progesterone comes in. So for women who have a uterus in place, we generally need to use a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Now, there's different strategies that we can use. Nowadays, we'll sometimes use a progesterone-containing IUD as a way to give the uterus um, progesterone. So again, different ways we can do it, but it's something we have to be conscious about because estrogen and progesterone has a greater risk of breast cancer and a greater risk of heart disease than estrogen alone. So always, these are all things that whenever, when, again, I, I totally don't believe in just handing women hormones because these are all complex issues that should be, um, that should be looked at. Now, one of the reasons why, um, why the conversation about hormones has become complex goes back to, I'm kind of dragging up history here, but goes back to 2002 when the WHI results came out. And this, this took everybody by surprise because our retrospective studies had shown that women who took hormones had a lower risk of heart disease and had had a lower risk of mortality, in fact. And so all of a sudden, they did this randomized controlled study called the WHI and came out with the conclusion that there were more risks of heart disease, more risks of breast cancer. Now, it was a little, the results were a little confusing. I mean, the newspaper came out very clearly saying, use of hormones gives you a 30% increased risk of breast cancer. And women just went off their hormones in droves, you know, picked up their fans, had their hot flashes, were just, were often miserable because of going off very suddenly. Um, and these are basically what the data showed. Now, these are with estrogen and progesterone. So I'm going to show you the estrogen data later. But again, these are just estrogen and progesterone. Well, the relative risk of heart attacks was an increase in 30%. That actually meant that there were 3.5 extra women per 1,000 women who might have a heart attack. So. 3.5 in 1,000 doesn't sound nearly as bad as a 29% increased risk. Um, strokes, 41%, four women in 1,000. Breast cancer, 26%, four women in 1,000. Clots in the veins or venous thromboembolism, 211%. Now that is a big one and that is a real one. Um, again, was nine per 1,000 women. But when we look at the actual numbers of increased women, it's much more reassuring than looking at the 
what are considered the relative risks. So, um, and there were some benefits, of course. There was a decrease in, in colon cancer and there was a decrease in hip fractures. Um, another way of looking at this is in a graph form. I, I won't go over this, but basically it, it shows you that yes, there's an incremental increase in the patients who were on hormones, which are the blue bar graphs, compared to the women who were on placebos. But, you know, all women who were in this age group had a relatively high risk of heart attack, stroke, breast cancer, and so the increased actual risk, the increased numbers of women is relatively small. But again, huge reaction to this. Now, there are these increased risks. So again, I'm not trying to minimize it that if you don't, it's one of the reasons if you don't need hormones, you shouldn't be on them. But if you do need them, you do want to look at what these actual numbers are to make a decision of whether the risk benefit is worth it for you. Right. Well, you know, I'm going to save questions for the end, but I, but again, these are old, these are old studies. A lot of this has changed. And so, um, so I totally agree that a lot of it has changed. The average age in the WHI study, and these are some of the, some of the criticisms, the average age was 61 in the WHI study. Most of these women, so the average woman, had been off hormones for about 10 years. And so very different risks for the average woman in this study. So again, it's um, not, this is, th but this is what the world reacted to. And this is what we still hear a lot about. Um, and these are the estrogen only results, which didn't get talked about very much because they came out a couple of years later. The estrogen and progesterone part of the study was stopped early. So in this case, there were actually fewer heart attacks. Um, again, more strokes, but less breast cancer. Um, again, we had an increased risk of deep venous thrombosis, though not as high, and um, not much change in, in colon cancer, but there were fewer hip fractures. So again, these data look quite different, and the bar graph form shows, looks like this. Um, really, the only statistically significant increased risk on estrogen alone was the strokes, although the blood clots was close. Most things came out as being pretty neutral, um, and then there was, if anything, what looked like a decrease in breast cancer and hip fractures. So one of the things um, is this issue of timing. So timing makes a huge difference, is that for women who are just starting menopause, their overall risk of heart disease is less, and, it, and their risk ratio turns out to be less in terms of increased risk of heart disease. So if you look at just this, um, if you look at just this top area, what you see is women who were on hormones less than 10 years, although it's not statistically significant, but they did have actually a, a decreased risk of heart disease. Their overall risk was decreased. Whereas the longer they were off, uh, the longer they, the longer since they went through menopause, their risk increased. Um, it increased, you know, every ten years they had they had a increase in re in risk, and then the estrogen data is even more is even more convincing that if women had been in hormone off if women had been in menopause less than ten years they appear to have a decreased risk of heart disease, not quite statistically significant, but very close. And then the longer they've been off hormones, the long, excuse me, the longer they've been in menopause, the less, the more likely they are to have risks accrue. Um, this graph is the same if we looked at the age of the woman. 
So again, the younger the age, so women who are in their 50s when they start the hormones have basically graphs when it comes to heart disease that look very much like this. And same with breast cancer. So again, all of these risks that we've been worried about do seem to be related to how long a woman's been in menopause and what the age of the woman is when she starts the hormones. Well, this all starts to make sense then because the retrospective studies were looking at women who went on to hormones as soon as they went on menopause. And those studies were always very reassuring. So again, the WHI study, although it's still our gold standard, it's still our randomized placebo-controlled study, um, it has a lot of faults in the study. So when are hormones the best option? The time when women have the greatest need for them is when they're having hot flashes and night sweats during the perimenopausal time period, when they're going through the transition. So it's that first three to five years or so where they're going through the transition. When is their risk the lowest for any kind of serious diseases? Heart disease, breast cancer, strokes. Their risk is the lowest at the same time during that first three to five years or when they're going through the transitional period. So again, this is, it's very reasonable to consider hormones at this time. Um, now things like breast cancer start to increase after five to 10 years. So, so this doesn't mean women should be on hormones forever, but they can, may significantly improve their quality of life if they take them for those three to five years when their symptoms are the worst. So again, just not for everybody, but, um, but it, a good reminder. So hormone treatments. Um, there are synthetics. Again, Premarin, Provera was what was used in the WHI study. Um, we virtually never use those anymore for multiple reasons. Um, the trend has been to use bioidentical hormones. Why not use the same type of hormones that women make? Um, and so estrogen or estradiol is one of the three hormones that women make. We now have multiple FDA approved types of estradiol that we can give women that work very well. Um, they come in pills, in patches, in gels, in sprays. There's definitely a move to use the um, transdermal, so that would mean the patches, the gels, the sprays, because those don't go through the liver quite the same way as the pills do, and so they have a lower risk of deep venous thrombosis. Remember, one of the, one of the side effects that was significant was deep venous thrombosis, so we can really minimize that by using transdermal forms. Now, for some women, the only concern they have is vaginal dryness. And for women where the only concern is vaginal dryness, their goals may be met very well just by using vaginal estrogen. And we have lots of options there, too. We have a ring. We have tablets that can go in the vagina. We have creams that can be used. So again, lots, lots of options depending on what meets your needs, what works for you, what's easy, you know, effective, et cetera. Um, compounded estrogens are um, not recommended by the American College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Most of, the, um, most of the powers that be feel that they don't have any advantages, that there may be disadvantages in terms of having different dosing or, or problems in the compounding itself. And since we do have FDA forms, there's not much reason to, to use compounded. Again, with some rare exceptions. Um, the progesterone can also be given in pills. Um, or as I mentioned before, sometimes if our only goal is to, is to reduce the risk of uterine cancer in the uterus, we can do that rather nicely by using a Mirena IUD. And then your systemic 
treatment is a estrogen alone, which we feel has lower risk than the combination of estrogen and progesterone. There are also non-hormonal options. Um, if hot flashes are the main problem, and perhaps you've had breast cancer or some reason why you really should not take hormones, um, some of the antidepressants can be used in very low doses. Um, we've used Effexor for a long time, and Brisdell was just recently FDA approved. Brisdell is similar to Paxil. Um, gabapentin can be used off-label. That's a medication that's used for neuropathies and, and seizure disorders, uh, but it does work with hot flashes as well. And there's just been a new medication, which I don't even have on here, that's, um, that, that has, let's see, has it been FDA approved? If it hasn't, it's really close. I think it has been. It's a combination of a CIRM and Premarin. So it's like Premarin alone plus a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And we'll hear more about that, but maybe it's going to be you know, the perfect medication. The only thing I see about it right now that I don't like is the fact that it's oral. And so there is going to be the increased risk of deep venous thrombosis. Um, for vaginal dryness, uh, again, we don't worry too much about the vaginal estrogens, even for women potentially who've had breast cancer. Um, although, if you're on an aromatase inhibitor, you really can't use even the vaginal estrogens. And now we have a new kit on the block that's been around for about a year called Osfina, which is a pill taken by mouth, a non-estrogen. Um, it is actually a CIRM, so it acts like an estrogen on some tissues, but it acts like an anti-estrogen on other tissues. And then finally, if sleep is the whole problem, sometimes just addressing the sleep can go a long way in addressing all of the problems. So not to forget long-term issues. Um, again, osteoporosis, 50% of women will sustain fractures in menopause. It usually happens much later, but the time to start paying attention to exercise <laughs> and calcium and vitamin D really is, is during the perimenopausal time period. That's when the bone loss really starts. Um, heart disease, it's the number one killer in women. We start to see an acceleration of heart disease in menopause when you don't have those protective estrogens anymore. And so, um, so again, paying attention to exercise, <laughs> Healthy diet, lifestyle are all very important. And then cancer, again, there's some, the same things. Exercise reduces the risk of breast cancer by 30%. The same things that are going to keep you healthy in terms of your other organ systems are also going to help reduce your risk of cancer. So thinking about change, thinking about how to address change, um, Look at your lifestyle. Make sure you've got that in good shape first. So in summary, if you live long enough, you will go through menopause. I hope you all do because, again, average age about 51. It can be anywhere from 45 to 55. Each woman's journey is very individual, and how it's managed should be very individual. And one third of our lives may be spent in menopause. So we want to be sure that it's a good one third of our lives. Um, for more information, again, Nurse Barb has just written a book. I've read this. I enjoyed it. It's one you can, you can put by your bedside and read for 20 minutes every night. It's very readable. It's good information. It's accurate information. So I would encourage it. If you don't win it at the raffle, I'm sure you can, you can buy it on Amazon. Well, thank you all very much. I think maybe you're going to be able to get your book now. Oh, you don't need this, do you?